now say, door is open for questions. If you could talk up, and I'll try and pass this around to the people. threshold. Anything under is called adventitious. However, there are exemptions for oils, sugars and highly processed foods, as well as foods that are not packaged. So if you go to Bimmy, you may find that the soybeans and the corn and all that could be GMO. We did ask that uh, Molenberg bread, a lot of the prepared breads have got soy in. We wrote that I rank, got the 0800 number, so this is something worth doing, and said, please could you tell us all about the soy? And they have just come back and said it's less than one percent. So I didn't think about it, but I think they mean it's less than one percent GMO, so we don't need to label. I think we need to just tease out that. So anybody, if you can ring the 0800 number and ask, what is the level of soy in your food and is it GMO? And I'll get back to you. Clear. Sorry. Just, just one thing on the, the 84 different food lines that have been approved. Not all of them will be in our food. They've been approved in case food is contaminated with them. That means that food will be legal. But there will be a big chunk. There might be 40 or 50 of those food lines that are coming in with imported foods, say from the states that are already processed in terms of uh, corn chips and the likes. We're not importing a lot of corn from the US, but we do import product. Um, but then we do import a huge amount of soy uh, into New Zealand from the US or South America. And so, so there's a whole range of different soy food lines. Or the canola oil that Clear mentions that doesn't have to be labelled. The canola in New Zealand comes from Canada. It's GE. Yeah. Um, anyway, I'm T. Thank you. Can I just say, I've done some reading last year on, although we have the limits of what, over 1% it should be labelled, what I had read was the last testing they did was in 2003. They found that food in the supermarkets, 30% of it had over that 1% of GE um, mm food in it, ingredients in it, none of it was labelled, there was no follow-up done, it was dropped, and no testing has been done since. So there are no testing. Speed of this, 50 case, putting no one out there to monitor it, it doesn't happen, no one's checking what's coming in, there is GE in our food. Can I just make a couple of observations? One is thank you, thank you, thank you for coming. <laughs> um, I'd, like to, I'd like to make a couple of things really clear is that New Zealand keeps selling itself as a green, green, green image, pure green. Don't forget that Agent Orange, which is an endo, sorry, disruptor, was made here in this country. It was designed and made and poisoned all of Vietnam, and it's now been poisoning all over South America. So if you buy any food from South America, you can be guaranteed that if it hasn't been sprayed with Glyphosate has been sprayed with Agent Orange. The other thing is that today on the national program, I heard a scientist say that the TB problem that is, by the way, not caught from living um, opossums, it's actually caught from dying opossums uh, by our cattle, 
It's such a problem now that the um, poison that they're dropping in our rivers and in our forests and killing our deer and our, our na native birds and flora and fauna all throughout this beautiful, clean, green country. Our waterways are being poisoned with this Excuse stuff. Me. Could you I'm, ask the question? Uh, I, I, I'm, is I'm coming because this is an important one, thing. Can we talk about it when we've done a question? This is a question. Oh, sorry. Okay, sorry, I'm just coming to it. Because I want these people to ask the question of themselves and of, the, of everyone. What, when we, um, they're now talking about a, a genetically modified cattle in New Zealand to make them um, resistant to TB. They found that if they put mice gene inside our cattle that, um, has anyone else heard of this or am I all on my own? No, 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 that was announced uh, as a possibility uh, in some studies recently. I, I don't know the details, but that is being proposed. It was being Again, what we're seeing here is a, um, a s what, what chemicals and do and the genetic engineering does in agriculture is to cover up symptoms. If it, do it fails to acknowledge the root causes of the problems that are in endemic in, ag in industrialised agriculture around the world, and, as, and all it does is try to cover up uh, the, the symptoms. So that's not only genetically engineering our crops, but also even genetically engineering animals, poultry, pigs, cows. All of this is being is in the pipeline. Thank you. Yeah, good. Thank you very much. Good question. Okay. Um, a while ago, I read um, a book about cancer and stuff, and there was a polio vaccine in America, and it causes cancer, and it's passed down now through generations and stuff. Do you believe that this will be something as well? Like, what we're eating now as mums has had effect on our children when they grow up now, and is it is it reversible? Like, with going organic for our children now, will it help prevent what I ate? <laughs> excellent, excellent point. You may remember during my presentation, I mentioned this phenomenon called epigenetics, which is uh, what uh, globally controls the function of the genes within DNA. It turns out that changes in our epigenetics as an adult, for example, in uh, pregnancy especially, that can then take place also in the developing fetus. These epigenetic changes, which were once thought to just stop with the adult, actually can be passed down the generations. So, so any alterations in the epigenetic status in one generation, in other words, just to say it again, can be passed down the generations. And sometimes these effects can skip a generation, so it may not be the children that are affected by the epigenetic change, but the grandchildren with illnesses such as predisposition to certain cancers, because we now know that epigenetics disturbance rather than direct DNA damage is an equally, if not more of an important contributor to cancer formation uh, or obesity as well. Now, the good message from that, there are two good messages from that really to take. Uh, the one key one that is, uh, gives us hope is that unlike the genes that we inherit, which we're stuck with, you know, we can't change those. Epigenetics is dynamic. It's responding constantly to internal and external stimuli. Responding for better or worse, depending on what it is that we're exposed to, what diet, what lifestyle, what behavior, psycho-emotional status. All of these are impacting through epigenetic media, uh, impacting on our gene function for better or worse, through altering the epigenetic layer of control. What that means is that if, unknowingly or knowingly, depending on what it is, we've disturbed our epigenetics and things have gone off kilter and predisposing us to an illness, we're not stuck with it. With the right lifestyle intervention, we've heard a lot from Michelle tonight about the kinds of lifestyle interventions that we can bring in with eating you know, good, clean, pure diets at their basis can lead to better health because they can, the epigenetics can be reset. And so that is uh, the, the hope that it brings. It also brings great responsibility 
the knowledge of epigenetics throws a great deal of responsibility back on ourselves because depending on how I treat not only myself but my family, that's going to affect their gene expression patterns for better or worse. So it brings great responsibility, but at the same time it brings great hope because we know we can change the epigenetics and rebalance cell gene function, bringing us back to health. I just want to add to that. This, this is why I realized it's not enough for my family to eat organic because my son's future spouses are out there somewhere. <laughs> right? Maybe even here, they're coming to visit. <laughs> so who knows, right? And we want our children to be able to experience the profound love that it is to be able to have one's own child, if they wish to. You know, when I found out the third generations of rats that ate GMOs were sterile, there was a huge light bulb that went off. You know, so it's, it's important for not just for our families to eat organic as much as we can, but for all families to do so. Just one more point regarding your question. Um, back home as integrated docs, we recommend a prenatal cleanup. So for the, prior to conception, for three to six months, we do a, a generalized cleanup. It depends on, on the health of the uh, couple to make sure that we clean all this stuff out. But if you already have a kid, it's not too late to do a cleanup. And there are very uh, various detoxification methods that we use, and they're successful. What I didn't mention in my uh, depressing talk was that about 80 to 90 percent of my patients get better, including autism, totally reversible, with some clauses. But these diseases, these chronic diseases that we talked about, can be treated successfully. Do you have information that we can read from New Zealand on your clinic for how we can help our children? Do you have like some information, some um, something that I could give my eight-year-old daughter to see if I could? What a great idea. <laughs> That's my plain homework. Um, I'm gonna, there are sites and there are books about how you do this. I don't, we're going to have to talk and I'll have to tell you some things. It's not condensed, like, oh yeah, this is the book you go to. It's in various locations and references. But that is something I think I'm going to work on. That's not the topic of the book I'm writing, but I think you're absolutely right, and that's what we need to do. Thank you very much. But it's, it's not one size fits all, though. Mm -hmm. As she mentioned, there's kids with different types of deficiencies that need different things. Um, you didn't mention this, though, but some kids, like with pickiness, and when she puts zinc in, they, they um, as a deficiency, they start to be less picky. You know, it's, so it really depends on the kid. But number one, eat organic, put the raw organic sauerkraut and different probiotics in their foods. Really, you will start seeing huge changes just in that. Yeah. You start there. Yes, this gentleman had his hand up for one. Um, thank you very much. It's um, very, <laughs> it's all very informative. But um, we've got two two levels of action. One is what we can do ourselves, and the other is in relationship to the system, so the systemic problem. And in regard to the systemic problem, uh, those in the system are attempting to make the, system, the problem even worse. Yeah. And so. The idea of GMOs being equivalent to conventionally grown food and organics will be, if you like, institutionalised under the multilateral free trade agreements that are being negotiated between the USA and the Pacific nations in TPP and the USA and the European nations in TTIP. And the large corporations are the ones that have most of the say in that, and it's not just in respect to GMOs, but in a whole host of other areas, including the property, the intellectual property that you guys produce, right, and share with us about, not just about health matters, but in all sorts of other areas, is going to become a lot more expensive for us to purchase here in New Zealand. Also, our rules in respect to labelling will go out the window. Yes, absolutely. Right? They yes. will go out the window. And we will not know at all what's going on in respect to the food that we get from supermarkets or from the corporations. So sure, we can go into our individual little holes and grow our own veggies and all the rest of it, but if we don't have green thumbs, right, we're reliant on a system which is going to be poisoning us. And the rules that are going to be agreed will be made so that we can't do anything about it, unless we do something now. Yes, right. it's, it's so coming now. up right now. Let's give people a website to go to, Claire. Is it is it just exposed to TPP or exposed TT? Here locally, it's, it's ourfuture.org.nz. Okay, everybody get that? 
So what he's talking about is an international trade agreement, which is being proposed right now in the next two or three weeks, which is written by 600 corporations. And in America, they're trying to fast track it and push it through without the Senate and the Congress even being able to look at it. And it makes things like GMO labeling a barrier to free trade. So they will eliminate that. And anything else which can be see perceived as a barrier to free trade, like if, for instance, comparing organics to um, conventional food and somehow even insinuating that organic is better will go away. Also, um, we would be importing medicines from other countries, and God knows what would be in that. It wouldn't have to be labeled. Um, a lot of your internet rights would go away. A lot of jobs would go away. It is basically an entire global or oligarchy, right? It's, it's, a, it's a theft of our sovereignty. And your, na your national rights and your national economy will be completely compromised. So it's the most patriotic thing that you can do is to call your council members or your representatives, whatever that is, and tell them you do not want this. It is it is not a good deal for local people. Thank you. Can I just go add to that? Um, and add it, if you like. Tomorrow at 2.30, right, there is a meeting at Careerton Town, uh, Careerton Hall, so Car um, Karen Road, is it? Yeah. Karen Road, and um, I, Greg, We'll speak to whoever's there about what we can do about TPP here in New Zealand. And I've been working uh, around the countryside talking to lots of different people, Great. most recently in Mapia and Gisborne, but we've got councils in Wellington that are supporting a public interested resolution. In fact, we've got now seven councils that have uh, uh, supported this resolution, but I won't say too much more. Tomorrow, 2.30, at, um, at Britain Town Hall. Uh, at the I'd like to make one more point about something in California that uh, my mom's group just did. Um, in January, in California, in our government, they decided they were going to pass a law that they could spray for any perceived threat at any time. Any pesticide, any time. Was, no, no. No, no. No, they didn't. Because we followed an injunction, our mom's group, and it didn't pass. Yay. Because we, we filed a lawsuit against the state of California. Now, I'm not implying that you can do that here in New Zealand in your political situation. It may, it's different in California, but my mom's group, five of us, five women, one kitchen table, lots of coffee. And we, and I'm not a lawyer, um, our mom's group leader is a lawyer, so we're kind of lucky in that regard. But we found a lawyer who a pro bono work, aka her husband, and we filed it. And it's pending, and we put a hold on it. Now, I'm not saying we're going to be successful, but this is what's happening in our own state. So when I hear that we can't do anything, we tried, and, I, and I'm not implying the laws are here the same. I'm not so naive, but it, this is what we did, and that's what we're doing, and that's what we continue to try and do to jam up the system while we reorganize and re-strategize. That's the lady in the room. Hi, I'm Lisa Hall. You spoke about the gluten and in the glyphosate like, say that they put on the wheat to make it dry and fast and that if you if you separate the two, if you take organic gluten in isolation, is the is the gluten without the chemicals bad for you, just the plain gluten, or is it the glyphosate so, that makes the gluten bad? Right, the question is does the glyphosate make the gluten bad? Yeah. So if you already have a leaky gut from having had damage from already non-organic food or whatever else is going on, and you are now gluten sensitive, and even if you eat organic gluten, you can still react. Even though the glyphosate is, has not been applied to the organic gluten because your gut is already impaired. So you may need to come off it temporarily, heal the gut lining, rebound your microbiome, and then you may be able to eat it again if you have gluten sensitivity, but not the non, but not the celiac gluten sensitivity. If you don't have, if you have a healthy gut to start with? You should be able to tolerate gluten just fine. When um, I test children in my office, I do sensitivity and look to see if they have a leaky gut. I do test. You know, I can almost tell by taking the history and the exam of the patient, but I'll do testing. I do testing on about 95, percent of my patients, I look at immune function in their gut, I look at celiac biomarkers, I look at mold sensitivities, I look at environmental toxicities, I look at the gene profile of the microbes in their gut, I look at the digestive enzymes, I look for inflammatory markers in their stool, and I make very intelligent decisions
based on what I've learned. And now you're all going to move to California so she can be the doctor, right? <laughs> well, I wish I didn't. I didn't know any of this when I had my children. I didn't have a doctor like this, and I didn't know any of this science. So you know, if you don't have to have a doctor like this. You can start taking on these steps yourself. But you can also encourage your doctors to find out this information and to be doctors like this. It's only going to take people like you to demand this kind of service and, and care from your doctors. Okay, one more question. How confident can we be that food that's labeled organic truly is organic? I, I'm asking about America and then I'd love someone in New Zealand. In, in America, yeah, that's a good question because the contamination is, is really quite bad in America right now and up to, it allows up to 5% of GMO contamination in organic and that's randomly tested. Mm -hmm. Now we have non-GMO project verified in America which only allows 0.9%. So the gold seal in America is to get non-GMO project verified and organic, because organic means no pesticides, but non-GMO project verified doesn't mean no pesticides. It just means less than 0.9% of organic. So um, with the problem, now here, because you're not growing GMO crops, you don't have to worry so much about uh, contamination, but in the US, it's, it's very severe. In Australia, Steve Marsh is fighting a legal battle now around that. Um, so it's, it's very important and we, we have to stand for that. That's, that's why we're asking for GMO-free zones and for you guys to have a GMO-free country. We really need you to continue to stand for that and not allow it in. It's a really crucial time now. There's a lot of pressure being put down in your city council members. You need to tell your city council members that you don't want it. In the United States, they have 20 lobbyists every day pounding the pavement on the White House, in the White House getting paid $20,000 a month to tell the, our officials that this is a good thing. We need moms out there on force. You know, really. So, um, certified organic in New Zealand has the zero tolerance yeah. to GMO as far as the producer. We cannot use inputs, even let's say a fish fertilizer, the enzyme that might be used to break down the carcass of the fish at the factory must not be made from GMOs, and yet they can be. So that they look that finely at it. So we're in a very good position. Mm -hmm. And New Zealand, theoretically, we still have a zero, well, legally, we have a zero for importation of GM in seed or whatever coming into this country too. And uh, people want to change that, but let's hold it. Yeah. Okay. We, we look at losing that too. If the TPP is signed, we look at losing our GM-free status. I'm, I'm not sure about that. that. I'm not sure yes. about that. Grocer is uh, our trade minister <laughs> and he has done some incredibly good work <laughs> and has made it quite clear that new, they will not sign if New Zealand is disadvantaged. And acknowledging that we're only four million people or four and a half million and we can't afford as a nation, as an export nation that's totally dependent on our exports to have a decent standard of living, to have anything come into this country by way of overseas agreements that leave us in a disadvantaged uh, position. So, 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 so what did John, so John, 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 John Rees sign the other day? Shall we, excuse me, let's, let's just talk about the fact that we hope our parliamentarians will protect us and we also hope that, like Australia, we will withdraw from ICS provisions. Now, getting back to our now, can I talk now? I would just like you to know we are not testing for GMOs in any food in New Zealand today. So we need to question this urgently. I would also like to let you know we our minimum ABI for Roundup, which is why I say is 0.3 milligrams per kilogram a day. It's the same as Europe. It set that at that from a 1981 private hidden secret unpublished Monsanto study. Okay, so there has been so many studies since then that, that demonstrate danger and that demonstrate toxicity that our regulatory agencies aren't looking at that. The last time our regulatory agencies looked at Roundup um, was in the 2009 discussion document um, and that was supplied by Dow, AgroScience, and it contains studies that the Dow AgroScience selected. Since then, there have been dozens and dozens and dozens of studies in the world demonstrating toxicity, both to ourselves, to our endocrine system, and to our neurological system. Our EPA has not looked 
at the end of our story. Because our system is broken, either our EPA is powerless or our EPA is negligent. I'm not sure which one it is. So, what we need to understand is that we, we cannot care about anger if we don't eat sugar, sugar bait, wheat, barley, corn, soy, vegetable oils, lupins, um, I think potatoes. We can, we can not worry about anger. But this, this is what's in so much of the food I told me. In the chickens they take to school, in the chocolate bars they have after school. Um, and this is why, as parents, we really have to listen to these farmers. So, on that note, I know it gets very late, you've, you've stayed very, you've been great staying for so long. My name's Jo Brody, you can contact me, I'm a local person, if you have any further questions, I would love to talk. I can talk to you about Roundup until your ears drop off. <laughs> but I also want you to know that the sprays, the fungicides on our wheat are a thousand, time, a thousand times more toxic to ourselves than what our EPA actually looks at. I mean, look at the wheat that it's not just Roundup, this is a massive story. It's all the pesticides that are being assessed in our system are not being assessed correctly at the moment. So it's, it's please pass the message on the please talk. Thank you. But um, as Pierre said, the Food Matters Conference will be putting a lot of information up on their site from the speakers, and the speakers are absolutely incredible. I would like to say thank you very much, Dr. Michael Antonio, Dr. Michelle Taylor, and Dr. Michelle Taylor.